After his conversion, Paul sought to evangelize the Hellenists of Jerusalem, who responded by trying to kill him. Acts 9:29. The Hellenists were also the object of evangelism in Antioch of Syria. Acts 11:20. The Hellenists must have been ripe targets in the city of Ephesus. There was a synagogue there where Paul evangelized, Acts 19, 18, 19. And for all we know, there may have been several. In a commercial center like Ephesus, we should expect a substantial Jewish population and a significant number of successful Jewish entrepreneurs. In New Testament times, Ephesus was a large and prosperous port city located on the western coast of Anatolia, that is, of modern Turkey. In the centuries that followed, the port silted up, and the site of Roman Ephesus is now an inland site. It contained a huge outdoor theater, the one referred to in Acts 19, which could accommodate about 24,000 spectators. Years ago, I actually sat down briefly in the ruins of that theater during a Bible lands tour conducted my, by my friend and colleague at Dallas Seminary, Dr. Bruce Walke. Cornell and Matthews in their <clears throat> lavishly illustrated Atlas of the Roman World tell us this, quote, the life of Roman Ephesus is revealed not only by the extensive archaeological remains, but by the inscriptions which show the munificence of the leading families and its rivalry, rivalries with Sperna for the title First City of Asia. End of quote. You can still see today the ruins along a colonnaded road at Ephesus once lined with shops leading from the harbor to the theater. Of special interest to us right now is the famous library of Celsus. Archaeologists have excavated the remains of this library that was dedicated in the early second century to the Roman governor of the province of Asia. His name was Tiberius Julius Celsus Polymaianus. The construction of such a memorial to the governor shortly after the close of the first Christian century is eloquent. It is a powerful testimony to the high level of literary life in first century Roman Ephesus. Thus, when John published the gospel at Ephesus, he could anticipate a significant readership. As Graham Shipley has stated in his very thorough volume, The Greek World After Alexander, quote, a helpful definition of literature might be the circulated written works of a social elite, read or performed for enjoyment. It is important, however, to define one's elite. In this book, meaning Shipley's book, science, philosophy, and literature are treated separately, but for many practical purposes they were parts of the same set of social activities carried out by the same individuals from the up, upper wealth levels of society and their protégés who devoted their leisure to their chosen mode of cultural creation, end of quote. The original recipients of the fourth gospel could well have been an upper class Jewish social circle or a guild composed of educated Jewish artisans or other professionals or the fourth gospel could have gone first to a large extended Jewish family, many of whose members were educated readers. The possibilities are numerous. We just don't know which possibility is correct. In any case, John intended to evangelize the original readers. Capital B. The literary character of the last discourse. We come finally to the issue of the literary purpose of the last discourse. Since time is running out on us today, we can only lay out to you the basic premise. If the Lord permits, we will pick up the discussion tomorrow at the point where we leave it today. As we just saw, Ephesus was a good place to publish a book because 
It apparently had many readers at the highest echelons of society. Strikingly, the first librarian, a librarian of the famous library in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, was an Ephesian. His name was Zenodotus, who took that position about 248 B.C. The Greek students in my audience may be interested to learn that Zenodotus invented the original Greek accents, which were tonal accents, in his day. He came from Ephesus. Therefore, I propose that a cultured, literary Jewish circle in Ephesus was the original intended audience of the fourth gospel. How then would the last discourse in John 13 to 17 strike these original non-Christian readers? I may surprise you by my answer to that question. My answer is this. It would remind some of them, perhaps most of them, of a famous dialogue of Plato called the Phaedo. Plato lived from about 429 to 347 B.C. and, as you know, left behind a large number of dialogues. A modern, a modern writer has said, quote, these dialogues were written 2,300 years ago and the thought of the ancient world, the Renaissance, and that of contemporary times have all come under their influence, end of quote. And although Socrates is a familiar figure in the Platonic dialogues, there are only three dialogues that focus on the character and personality of Socrates, and these three are the Apology, the Crito, and the Phaedo. The Apology, of course, records Socrates' defense before the Athenian jury that condemned him to death. The Crito reports the effort by Socrates' disciple Crito to persuade him to accept the aid of his disciples to escape his impending execution by poison. Socrates refuses. Interesting as these dialogues are, right now I am concerned with the Phaedo. Needless to say, Plato's writings would be among the classics available at Ephesus. They would be of special interest there because Ephesus was situated in the Aegean Basin, in territory originally colonized by the Greeks and known to them as Ionia. I do not know of any piece of ancient literature to which the last discourse bears a stronger resemblance than it does to the Phaedo. The setting of the Phaedo is the last day of Socrates' life as he sits in prison, in his prison quarters, awaiting the delivery of the poison with which he will die. There Socrates is surrounded by his disciples. The form of the Phaedo, as we have said, is a dialogue. His disciples participate by asking or answering questions. This in itself is reminiscent of the last discourse in John's Gospel. The main content of the Phaedo consists of the words of Socrates himself. The topic under discussion between Socrates and his disciples, quite naturally, is the subject of the immortality of the soul. Socrates himself believes in the soul's immortality, but realizes he only has logical arguments for it. In the fi final analysis, he is not sure what comes after death. The Phaedo is introduced by an exchange between a certain Echocrates, probably a Pythagorean, and Phaedo, a disciple of Socrates. I'm using uh, for what follows the translation of Hugh Tredenick as found in the collected dialogues of Plato, including the letters, edited by the famous classicist Edith Hamilton and by Huntington Cairns. The Phaedo begins as follows. Echocrates, were you there with Socrates himself, Phaedo? when he was executed, or did you hear about it from somebody else? Phaedo, no, I was there myself, Echocrates. Echocrates, what then did the master say before he died, and how did he meet his end? I should very much like to know. Let me pause 
to point out that the words rendered, how did he meet his end, in the Greek of Plato's text, were kaipos et telupta. They are not an inquiry about the method of execution, since Echocrates would have known that it was by poison. Instead, this is a question that means, how did he face death? How did he behave? In antiquity, that was an important consideration, as we shall see tomorrow.